Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed lunch. It was uh, very good, I found, for a conference. They treat us well. Um, so it's my pleasure today to talk about uh, what I call a data science solution for uh, in the pharma world. So uh, for those of you who don't know pharma world, it's uh, um, extremely regulated. Um, of course, we are dealing with patient information and uh, another detail uh, of uh, any medical records and everything. So it needs to be very solid in everything we do. So I will give you an example today of uh, the type of interaction we have, the type of work we do, and uh, why we needed to have a smart, agile solution as we, um, as we developed. Um, so it's a pipeline which is generic, fairly generic. Uh, you have the sponsor company, so that could be, for example, AstraZeneca, developing a drug, and we want to test the hypothesis, is it working, in fact? Um, so what we do is that we don't run the trial ourselves most of the time. Uh, we have too many trials to run. So what we do is we um, contract uh, a company to do that for us. There are many companies doing that. Uh, they are called uh, contract research organization. Um, they are known under other acronym, but uh, mainly they will recruit the patient, run the trial, organize the sites, um, but they will not design the trial for you. So the design is still uh, on the shoulder of AstraZeneca. We will um, organize uh, what are the statistical tests to be run, what are the control to have, how many arms in your trial do you want, and everything. So it's fairly statistical work uh, on paper at the beginning, pure design, pure simulation. And we send that as a, as a document to the CRO. The CRO will work across the world to organize the, the trial for us. Depending on our level of engagement, it could be a fully outsourced clinical trial, or we do half of the work, um, but it's uh, most of the time completely outsourced. The CRO will basically generate the data from the, the site, so the sites are, are hospitals where we have the patients. And it came back to us, it come back to us to, as uh, basically the statistical report. So the statistical analysis is run inside the, the external company and they have multiple statistical tests to run. Uh, we describe everything they have to do, but sometimes they have to be inventive because it's not detailed enough. And there is where it, it, it bugs a bit. So they, we are here at this level where the CRO, the purple documents are. I don't know where is my mouse. But, uh, and um, we, we receive those documents, statistical analysis plan, and the problem is when the statistical analysis plan that they develop is not as we intended to be. So we describe that they would, what they should do, but we did not say, oh, they would do it. So exactly in the code. Um, and so because we have the responsibility of assessing the risk, the blue part of the, of the pipeline, we validate everything before we submit to the regulators. We have many things to do before submitting. And usually it works like that. So you receive the document from a CRO, and you're like, it looks okay, but it's not really what I was looking for. And so you get back with an email to the CRO and say, could you share the script that you use? They send you the script, but they don't send you the data. So, so you get back to them, you can have, in fact, uh, the, the data that goes with it, and uh, you pay for that. Every time you have an interaction with a CRO, you pay. So um, basically, at the end, you, you, you organize a video conference uh, with the CRO. You, you try to understand the statistics that they had behind. Basically, you need to find a statistician over there that runs the stuff. It becomes easily a nightmare. You escalate that to your manager. Your manager, yes, you can bring in a statistician from a statistical company, like for example, a quintile, a specialist basically, to work on a defined and agreed between the CRO and you statistical method to evaluate this particular problem. So for example, when will, trial, will, will your trial finish? Okay, so you want, you have a, your trial which is run for six months and you have an interim look into your data, un, a blinded look, so you don't know where the patient belongs to, which arm. Um, and you want to know how do you do this prediction in the future? So basically, you want to run a model and say, in 12 months, we should be finished. But there is so many interactions, it takes months to already agree on a procedure or to test that, that you end up at the end, you lose five months, and you try to make a prediction on data from five months ago. To make a, uh, uh, so it, you could have a new cut of the data, 
but you will not be able to do that anyway. So you see the, the need for developing something which is um, easy to use and regulated on both sides. So I will describe a particular problem, this particular problem of uh, predicting the, when you will reach a certain number of events in your trial. So in oncology, we measure basically two main things. Um, we measure overall survival, so that's how long you will survive when you have a cancer treated with a drug or not. Um, and what we call uh, an event, which is um, basically uh, in overall survival is death. Uh, and or any type of event, for example, a dropout, the patient dropout of the trial, it's, uh, it's all called a censure. So basically, we lose a patient from follow-up. So we don't have data for this patient anymore. Until the, the, the trial is run at T prime, and that's basically the trial end. Okay? And we have the other measure, which is progress on free event. So uh, progress on free survival, sorry. Um, and progress on free survival is how much do you... Uh, can you leave until the trial is uh, finished before you have uh, an oncology event, which is usually tumor growth. So it, it's complicated. There is medical concept behind, like a resist tumor growth and everything. But you, on your side, what you try to predict is, based on, on a set of assumptions that you made at the origin of the trial, you try to predict when the trial will stop with the power you want. So you want to be running, basically, a, you imagine simply a hazard ratio, so a cost correction model, and you want to measure the p-value of your hazard ratio with a certain power, okay? So they are able to show that. Does it work or not? And you want to be able to prove both. So the math behind running and this prediction can get very complex easily uh, because there is multiple ways of doing it. It depends on the data you have at the beginning, so you need to agree on that. It depends on uh, the assumption you made at the beginning, and if you have this assumption, if they are not made, you need to agree on it. And you need to validate, document, and have the both party work on it. And ideally, it should be no burden for the CRO and the sponsor to run those particular uh, statistical procedures. So that's, uh, that's kind of the, the context. You need to produce a solution. They come to us and say, we have this huge problem. Uh, can you do that with a very low cost and a, sol a small learning curve? So, I mean, my team is responsible for data science in, in AstraZeneca in the late stage pipeline. And uh, so <clears throat> we proposed an idea, but mainly it was to convince this guy that uh, our idea was uh, using shiny R and everything was kind of uh, a good solution. So, but I have a boss which is really great, so it, it worked. Um, the, the basic pipeline that we, we designed was why don't the CRO use the same tool as we do? So we could develop our internal pipeline, our internal procedure, uh, and do that. But it turned out that the CRO don't use the same version of R as us. We need to find the IT infrastructure inside the CRO to install the latest version of R. We don't know what servers they have. You imagine deployment nightmare uh, of running basically on Windows 2008, server, uh, anyway. You, you don't want to go there. So what we decided is that why don't we develop our first app internally on a web server with a shiny app and validate everything internally as an R package, build a shiny app on top of that, and work it through. And after that, deploy that on an Amazon cloud service for the CRO. So that's the idea. The concept is fairly simple. Basically, you would need a browser. Uh, tutorial and documentation for the both parties, and people are happy to go and uh, use the tool. <clears throat> so, at the beginning, we replaced the email chain. So, uh, you all know that. I was happy to see this uh, talk from uh, Sergey from the team group this morning about this email chain and this dialogue between the both parties, the manager and the data scientist. We all receive this kind of email chain with, at the end, attached a SAS script um, that you don't know where it comes from. You don't know if it's the latest version or not. Um, <clears throat> and you don't have access to the data. So what we did is that we replaced everything and we put all the process, those different ideas which were, we were in, uh, which were in uh, Excel files, in R script, in Swift document, and we put everything into our package. We validated the procedure. We did unit tests, test that, and everything. We developed a beautiful R package with the associated documentation. It took us quite a lot of time, 
but we um, generated this kind of uh, uh, study. So here you can see an example of the code. I think I have time to go a bit through that. Basically, you put your uh, assumptions, such as, as alpha, as a power, uh, the hazard ratio you want to test, and when does your trial will be finished? So that's the main question. And you run this process, and the process, you run this prediction, as you can see at the line in the middle, and you have the summary object, which is a textual object. It's, uh, basically, it's a text string. Um, it's also outputted as an object, which has all the values separated, but you cannot put the summary as a text string which is easy to read and integrate into your report. A bit strange, I should admit, but um, it's all they wanted it. And after that, we build a, a Shiny app on top of it. So the Shiny app was basically uh, just uh, hooking up all the process, the function from the R package, so that people that are knowledgeable in R can go in R, do a reproducible framework. That was a concern. Uh, we started using Shiny, and we noticed I mean, first, that people don't read the manual. So that was a problem. Second is, how do you reproduce your entire analysis in Chinese? Um, you want to be documented. You want to be auditable. Uh, what has happened on your trial and everything? So you need to reproduce things. So if you go all the way, uh, I mean, to complete reproducibility, you need to have our package in the back that people can write on their script. Sorry. Um, so we, we did both. Uh, not only the Shiny app. And, and I was really happy to see the talk from this morning from uh, Joe Sheng about that he was able to generate R code from his Shiny app, returning that. That was, I mean, that could be a solution for us, potentially. Um, so, we, so the package is, is AV. Uh, it's, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, we worked uh, a year on it to nail down all the, the, the mat. Um, we tested that with our statistician on real data, on simulated data set and everything. We are now writing guidelines, official guidelines in AstraZeneca. Everything needs to be documented. Uh, or use our package because a prediction is a dangerous tool. Um, if you tell to uh, a medic, and I excuse you, there is some medic in the, in the room. Uh, but if you tell him that uh, the trial will finish in September and... Uh, it turned out that when you stop the trial in September, you don't have the power required in your data set. You're, you're in deep trouble. Um, so you need to be very sure of your prediction. I know do you, do you do that. It's basically you, you restrict the access. You, you say you can use this tool for prediction only when you have this amount of data in the back and when your data are secure and clean and everything. So we, we built two tools. One is for designing trials entirely, so just on parameters. You have no data. You just have a set of assumptions. It's when you start a phase three trials. A phase three trial usually you run, I mean, hopefully you have run a phase one and a phase two trial before, and you have some preliminary result on your drug. You, you put that into the text box, and you have a curve of recruitment, and the recruitment will tell you, when uh, your trial is, uh, will be fully recruited first, and after that, when you have the number of events that you are required to have to show the, uh, the statistical significance. significance. What we did at the bottom is that you are able to uh, export, and that the little arrows, you are able to export your entire workflow so that the simile or producible idea we had at the beginning, all the code and the parameter you enter into your, the interface is exported as a PDF with all the graph and the result. So you are able to Take this text and put the same numbers and see that it works, and you're able to do that inside. It, it's kind of documented. Um, it's not as the same as having the code to redo everything, but it's almost the same. We can also do that on a cut of the data. So you obtain, basically, from uh, the contract research organization, you obtain a cut of the, of, uh, of the data, which are blinded, and you can extrapolate from the orig original recruitment curve, so that the uh, plot at the top, so um, the red curve, basically that's how many patients you are recruiting. Okay? And you want to see when will you be able to... Um, uh, now, the black curve is the recruitment, and the red curve are the number of events you are able to observe in your trial. Okay? So, and you want to extrapolate from this red curve until it's finished, and to say, well, approximately at this month, next year will be done. Um, and you're able to export all those plots. And you have diagnostic plot to see what, when, for example, an hospital is not reporting the number of events they should. Uh, and everything is kind of uh, 
validated, we run tests with our statistician. That's one thing we don't miss in pharma. We have tons of statisticians. So um, we, we can really rely on the AV uh, review of everything we do. And uh, there was one more thing, is that uh, uh, this tool is, of course, pushing the limit of what can you predict. And at one point, we, we, we wondered, uh, are we predicting too much? Because to, uh, when you run some trial, we have two arms, usually two or three arms, but uh, you have two arms, and you, you want to push and the precision as much as possible. And at one point, you need to try to make prediction on where the patient is to be a better. And if you try to do that, you try basically to unblind a trial. And that would be very bad. But you can make prediction on it based on the cut of the data. And that's a place where you don't really want to go. So, uh, because if you return the statistics to the medics, they will say, well, with 80% certainty, this patient is, was in fact treated and doesn't receive the placebo. So, I mean, we can push really far, but it's all about you know, documenting where you do and what you are able to report. So, yeah. So that's basically the discussion part of the talk. And uh, I hope it was informative. Um, at the moment, the application is widely used internally. It's, um, we are writing the guidelines. Um, from a set of script and Excel spreadsheet, we derive a full-scale uh, app. We have Shiny Pro uh, in, inside. Uh, we follow the lean approach. Basically, we work with a statistician right from the beginning. We did not work with uh, uh, the people that had the, um, uh, the big idea at the beginning. Uh, we created a small group of testers really close to us constant contact every week, testing the beta release and everything, and, and looking at all the bugs that came through. Uh, and there were many. Um, and after that, we, we have some challenges. For example, uh, as I mentioned, as soon as you develop a web interface, nobody read, in fact, the manual. And uh, that's a, a bit of a problem. So we, we have uh, kind of uh, ideas to have people check box and say, I acknowledge I read the manual. It's not really ideal. Um, the, the good stuff is that the feedback is constant, but it's also the bad thing is that the feedback is constant. Um, and uh, everybody wants its own specific graphics and stuff like that. Um, the other TA, so a bit of acronym, Pharma is really well known for a lot of acronyms. Uh, TA is therapeutic area. Uh, so we work in oncology, but now we have uh, cardiovascular and uh, molecular disease uh, people which want the same stuff for their trial. Uh, and because the tool is easy to use, we, uh, we need to have, as I said, a clear guideline when to use it. And that's the, the most tricky part. Uh, so the future step is really to make this tool freely available to everybody. Because that's the only way for spreading the, the message and agree on the method, publishing it in a peer-reviewed journal, agreeing on the mat, making it transparent for everybody to use, um, clear guidelines and agree on the CRO that they should use this tool when they make this kind of competition. And uh, really, uh, that the next stage is, uh, how do you maintain such tool on the long term? I mean, how do you maintain an open source tool in pharma when your mandate is not really to maintain this tool for other people? Uh, so if you have a solution, I'm ready to go and listen to it. Thank you. Thank you.